You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. Hi, Cyberwire listeners. This is Luke Vanderlinden, host of the Retail and Hospitality ISAC podcast. We're very excited to announce that our show is joining the Cyberwire Podcast Network. Join me every second and fourth Wednesday for chats with members of the InfoSec community to discuss the latest challenges, opportunities, and best practices unique to cybersecurity in the retail and hospitality industry. Check it out at thecyberwire.com slash RHISAC. That's thecyberwire.com slash RHISAC. And be sure to subscribe wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Funding for this episode is made possible in part by Black Kite. Drama and high stakes aren't just for the movies. Risk and Reels is a brand new podcast hosted by Black Kite's very own Jeffrey Wheatman, former Gartner analyst and cyber risk expert. Jeffrey and his industry friends chat about the trials, tribulations, and plot twists of movies and modern-day cybersecurity. The first three episodes are live now, featuring topics like hackers in real life and in the movies, breaking the status quo, and people-centric processes. Check them out at blackkite.com slash podcast or wherever you get your podcasts. CISA advises increased vigilance on the first anniversary of Russia's war. CERT UA reports current Russian cyber attacks were prepared in December 2021. How the war has changed the cyber underworld. Air raid alerts sound in nine Russian cities. Russia blames hacking. Our space correspondent Maria Vermasis speaks with Zana Maleko-Smith at the Center for Strategic and International Studies about a new security agreement between Japan and the U.S., Kathleen Smith of ClearJobs.net clears misperceptions about clear jobs, and Dole continues recovery from ransomware. From the Cyberwire Studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your Cyberwire summary for Friday, April 24th, 2023. The news at the end of this week has been dominated by the first anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency advised all organizations to stay alert for renewed, more intense Russian cyber attacks as the war against Ukraine enters its second year. The agency said, CISA assesses that the United States and European nations may experience disruptive and defacement attacks against websites in an attempt to sow chaos and societal discord on February 24, 2023, the anniversary of Russia's 2022 invasion of Ukraine. CISA urges organizations and individuals to increase their cyber vigilance in response to this potential threat. CISA draws particular attention to its DDoS attack guidance for organizations and federal agencies and its Shields Up webpage. According to Bleeping Computer, CERT UA has detected cyber attacks this week against Ukrainian government networks that used a web shell installed in December 2021. A Russian threat actor tracked as Ember Bear, also known as UAC 0056 or Lorek 53, used it to install three back doors Cred Pump, Hoax Pen, and Hoax Ape in February 2022 as the invasion was imminent. They've maintained a presence through this week. The State Service of Special Communications and Information Protection of Ukraine described the incident as a failed attempt by Russia to stay visible in cyberspace. Ember Bear is generally believed responsible for the Whispergate wiper attacks conducted against Ukrainian targets at the outset of the war. 
the use of such wipers has been a defining feature of Russian intelligence services' cyber campaigns against Ukraine. Ars Technica summarizes recent research and concludes that nowhere on the planet has ever been targeted with more specimens of data-destroying code in a single year. TRM, in a study of the illicit blockchain ecosystem as it's evolved under wartime circumstances, finds that the venerable Conti ransomware gang has resurfaced in the form of several splinter groups. The principal successor to Conti, TRM believes, is Karakurt. Coinbase reports that Karakurt, like its predecessor, has targeted healthcare organizations. It's significant that Conti declared its adherence to the cause of Russia in the immediate wake of the invasion, and that shortly after that declaration, a cyber criminal with allegiances that ran toward Ukraine doxed Conti. That doxing, along with hostile attention from law enforcement, is held to have precipitated Conti's fading from view. This seems, the register writes, to have been part of a more general disruption of the Russophone criminal underworld. That underworld isn't confined within the borders of Russia, but has extended to Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, the Baltics, and the nations in the South Caucasus and Central Asia, all formerly parts of the Soviet Union. They had, by general agreement, tended to refrain from hitting targets in the former Soviet Union. That shaky unanimity has been shivered to pieces under the stress of war. A study by Recorded Future concludes that Russia's invasion of Ukraine appears to have fractured gangland along national and political lines. Recorded Future writes, The so-called Brotherhood of Russian-speaking threat actors located in the CIS has been damaged by insider leaks and group splintering due to declarations of nation-state allegiance both in support of and opposed to Russia's war against Ukraine. Recorded Future adds that there have also been perturbations in the criminal labor market, stating, Russia is experiencing a wave of IT brain drain that will likely decentralize the organized cybercriminal threat landscape. In addition to brain drain, waves of military mobilization of Russia's citizens are resulting in decreased activity on Russian-language dark web and special access forums. There are also some other effects the war is having on the underworld. The larger economic dislocations seen in Russia especially, but elsewhere as well, are changing the cyber gang's cost-benefit calculus. Recorded Futures Insect Group writes, The economic consequences of the war in Ukraine are likely creating conditions conducive to an increase in the value of payment card fraud on the dark web, despite an overall slump in carding volume in 2022. Regardless of fraud's reputation as an unsophisticated form of cybercrime, it is likely becoming less a crime of opportunity than of survival. International arrests, seizures, and disruptive actions have destabilized the business model associated with commodified cybercrime, leading to wide-ranging and rippling effects on the malware and ransomware-as-a-service threat landscapes. These disruptions have also spread to the dark web shop and marketplace ecosystem, leading to price fluctuations and newfound competition among market administrators. Cybercrime, both based in the CIS and globally, is entering into a new era of volatility as a result of Russia's war against Ukraine. Those effects remain to play out, but the criminal marketplace seems to be undergoing some significant shifts. Medusa reports that missile alerts sounded in nine Russian cities on Wednesday— Russia's Emergency Situations Ministry confirmed in its Telegram channel that the false alarms were broadcast over radio stations whose networks had been hacked and should be disregarded. The alerts were also distributed by text messages. The register reports that regional authorities in some of the affected cities blamed collaborators of the Kyiv regime, that is, Ukrainian hacktivists, or, and this is a more interesting possibility, Russian dissidents for the incident. Dole PLC says that the ransomware attack it sustained remains under investigation and that the impact to Dole operations has been limited. No further details are available, although Computing points out, without claiming attribution, that in 2021, R-Evil hit food processing firm JBS with a ransomware attack. 
In any case, the incident shows, again, how ransomware can interrupt physical supply chains. And finally, CISA yesterday released three industrial control system advisories. As always, apply updates per vendor instructions, and happy trails. Coming up after the break, our space correspondent Maria Vermatsis speaks with Zana Maleko-Smith at the Center for Strategic and International Studies about a new security agreement between Japan and the U.S. Kathleen Smith of clearjobs.net clears misperceptions about the cleared space. Stay with us. And now, a word from our sponsor, Black Kite. Have you ever felt like sprinkling a few words of wisdom from the Godfather into your cyber strategy? Keep your friends close, but your third-party vendors closer. Or maybe, leave the extra budget, take the cannoli. Black Kite's very own Godfather of cyber risk, Jeffrey Wheatman, a former Gartner analyst and cyber risk expert, knows firsthand that security teams day-to-day sometimes contains enough drama to rival the silver screen classics. That's why he's hosting a new podcast powered by Black Kite called Risk and Reels, where he and industry friends chat about all things cinema, cybersecurity, and where they intersect. The first three episodes are live now featuring topics like hackers, real-life ones and ones in the movies, breaking the status quo, and people-centric processes. Check them out at blackkite.com slash podcast or wherever you get your podcasts. Struggling to keep up with the demands of managing and securing identity in your distributed enterprise IT environment? You're not alone, but don't let it hold you back. With Strata's identity orchestration platform, you can secure all your apps on any cloud with any IDP, so your IT teams will never have to refactor for identity again. Imagine modernizing app identity in minutes instead of months deploying passwordless on any tricky old app, and achieving business resilience with always-on identity, all from one lightweight and flexible platform. Want to see it in action? Share your identity challenge with Strata on a discovery call, and they'll hook you up with a complimentary pair of AirPods Pro. So don't miss out. Visit strata.io slash cyberwire. That's strata.io slash cyberwire. Maria Varmatsis is our CyberWire space correspondent, and she recently spoke with Jana Maleko-Smith from the Center for Strategic and International Studies about a new security agreement between Japan and the U.S. Maria files this report. My name is Jana Maleko-Smith. I am a senior associate with the Aerospace Security Project at CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where I'm also an adjunct fellow in their Strategic Technologies Program, as well as a Cyber Law Fellow with the Army Cyber Institute. Thank you so much. And you are absolutely the perfect person to speak to you about the news that you sent my way, actually, about a new agreement between the United States and Japan. Could you walk me through that and and what that means? The U.S.-Japan Space Pact Agreement recently signed on January 13th, is about promoting civil space cooperation. It reaffirms two significant programs. One, Japan's involvement in the NASA-led Artemis Accords program, which is an international space exploration program. Japan was one of the original seven parties to sign this agreement in 2020. The ambition of the program is to return humans to the moon in 2025 and also support a crewed mission to Mars towards the end of 2030. Apart from affirming the vitality of the Artemis Accords program, the U.S.-Japan Bilateral Space Pact Agreement signed this month also supports the Lunar Gateway Project, which is to develop a orbiting lunar research station around the moon. Mm. Okay. So that's that's awesome. And 
the there's been these there are these two phrases that have been coming up a lot in the context of this agreement about the open space treaty and the phrase peaceful purposes. Can you walk us through why those are important and why they're coming up in this agreement specifically? In the very title of the most recently signed space framework agreement between Japan and the United States, you'll notice that in the title it says the use of space for peaceful purposes. And in my research, I I argue that that is significant in a forthcoming peace with CSIS because it affirms the landmark Outer Space Treaty of 1967 and specifically echoes language in the preamble of the treaty about the preservation of space and the exploration and use of it for peaceful purposes. Here's where it gets interesting Mm. because the term peaceful purposes is not expressly defined in the treaty. And prior to the treaty even being signed in 1967, there was a significant discussion about what does peaceful purposes mean and a divergence of views. The majority view, one held by the United States, is that peaceful purposes, as enshrined in this treaty, refers to non-aggressive activities mm-hmm. like scientific research, think intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance activities. Contrast that with the minority view held by several states such as Japan, India, and Iran, arguing that the term should be more narrowly interpreted, focusing on the demilitarization of space and that it exclusively be used for peaceful purposes. Now, you can go back and read on the United Nations website the history of this this long-standing discussion about what does peaceful purposes mean. And one of the ambassadors representing the Iranian delegation stated that the draft treaty should stipulate, and this was a recommendation he offered, that, that the treaty should stipulate the exploration and use should only serve peaceful purposes. By their definition of peaceful purposes, right, non-military. And that opens up a whole other issue of how peaceful purposes is is interpreted across different languages and cultures. What activities should be nestled underneath that? Yes, that's a that's a good point, Maria. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't help but wonder, and I, I am not a person who's very comfortable with law or treaties or anything like that. But I, as a person who's a nerd for language, the, the, the fact that that phrase was not defined and left open for interpretation makes me wonder, was that on purpose? Or was that sort of a, placeholder for we'll figure this out later and here we are several decades later still trying to figure that out? That is a good question and I I can see both sides to it. One being strategic ambiguity. At the same time, there's value in signaling to your allies, partners, and your peer competitors transparency around the term peaceful purposes to reduce the risk of uh, unintentional conflict escalation here. Absolutely. So this agreement, going back to the the U.S.-Japan, the new agreement. Yes. So does this actually represent a change for Japan's posture on peaceful purposes? Or is it sort of a continuation of what they've been doing? Or is it an escalation? Or how would we characterize this? I would describe the framework agreement as an accelerator. If U.S.-Japan space collaboration partnerships prior to this agreement was a computer, you can think of the framework agreement as like adding hardware accelerator to enhance the performance of the computing system. So yes, it affirms Japan's commitment towards the NASA Artemis program, the Lunar Gateway project, and deepening scientific and research collaboration in this space. The tenor of the the agreement and the, the press statement talking about the agreement focuses on civil space collaboration. Interestingly, the actual text of the agreement has not yet been released. So I'm very Mm. careful to present this as a a broad-based legal agreement focusing on civil space cooperation. That said, what about deepening defense space cooperation ties between the two countries? It's an open question whether or not this agreement could be used as a vehicle for that. And what we'll have come March is more textual nuance to chew on because the countries have announced a plan to hold a comprehensive dialogue on space to build on the agreement and strengthen space cooperation. Mm. And that is for this specific framework. However, uh, if we look at the January 11th press conference, a joint statement issued by the Security Consultative Committee, there was a mentioning in in that text that 
Japan and the United States have agreed that attacks to, from, or within space could lead to the invocation of Article 5 of the U.S.-Japan Treaty. And that's, to me, as a, a person who studied Japan for a while, that's a big deal. Can you, maybe I'm overstating it, but could you, for our listeners, tell them what Article 5 means in this, in this context? Sure. And it is an important legal agreement, certainly. It is the the full title. It's the Treaty of Mutual Cooperation and Security between Japan and the United States. And Article 5 recognizes that each party regards an armed attack, which is a legal term of art, against either party in the territories under the administration of Japan would be dangerous to its own peace and safety and declares that it would act to meet the common danger in accordance with international law. So. While more information will be forthcoming on the nature of the space framework agreement, focusing on civil space cooperation, simultaneously we see this joint statement being put out talking about national security concerns and how to modernize the alliance. So mm-hmm. it's a fascinating area and we'll know more in the, the coming months. Yeah, well, we'll definitely need to check back in with you after the update in March because I'm super curious where this is heading. And I, I can't help but wonder with everything that happened, especially last year between Russia and Ukraine and the Viasat attack, where cyber attacks might fit in with this. I I don't want to speculate because obviously it remains to be seen, but I'm very, very curious and we'll definitely need to follow up with you in March, Anna. So thank you so much for walking us through this. This is fascinating and important, and I'm really glad you were here to tell us all about it. So thank you. Thank you, Maria. It's been a pleasure. And I'd say the the concluding takeaway is that peaceful purposes fundamentally is about being a good steward of space. So thank you. Thank you so much. There's a lot more to this conversation. If you want to hear more, head on over to the CyberWire Pro and sign up for interview selects where you'll get access to this and many more extended interviews. And I am pleased to be joined once again by Kathleen Smith. She is the Chief Outreach Officer at ClearJobs.net. Kathleen, always great to welcome you back to the show. Uh, As someone who has never held a security clearance and uh, honestly is perfectly fine with that, (laughs) uh, I am sure that I have a lot of misperceptions when it comes to what exactly is going on when it comes to hiring in that cleared space what are some of the things that you run into in terms of misunderstandings, misperceptions from from folks who may be new to it? So many misconceptions all the time. Um, the biggest one on the candidate side, the job seeker side, is that they pay for their security clearance or they're willing to pay for it to get a security clearance. And we you know, frequently tell them, hmm. no, you know, you are not the person that gets the security clearance, your future employer gets that for you and that there is a process. The other one that is similar to that is I will make more money if I have a security clearance. And that is a misconception Hmm. because all of the government contract positions and government agency positions have certain labor categories. And so it is very codified as far as how much money you're going to be able to make. What we really find with a lot of employers who are trying to find this talent is they believe if they throw money at it that they can find the talent. And there will be a staffing agency that will tell you, yeah, just send us, give us a big commission and we'll find you the bodies. They might not necessarily find you the right people, but they will find you people with security clearances. But you know, you're, when you're trying to fill a position within the government contracting space, You're first trying to find someone with a specific type of clearance. And then within that, Mm. you're trying to find someone who has 10 to 15 years experience in a specific category. You're then also trying to make sure that they definitely have a graduate, excuse me, a college degree certifications. And then the other problem is they have to meet the culture And this is something that's similar between the corporate world and the government contracting world is that when you're looking at 
people supporting the mission, people who are doing difficult work. There's a lot of stress. And when you build a team, you need to make sure that everybody sort of meshes with that culture. Culture is so important when you go and you talk to people who are in a SCIF or someone who's part of a large government contractor or a small government contractor. You really have to look at what that culture is. Is it many hands do light work and we're willing to everyone do everything or are we uh, a group of people who are very specialized? And I think that this is one thing that's interesting that we see a lot with doing our in-person events is that people come to them, recruiters specifically come to the in-person events to hire people because they get to answer that question right up front. Will this person meet Mm. the culture? Because you can go through the overall hiring process. Yes, they have the clearance. Yes, they have the experience. Yes, they have the certification. But the final step in that hiring process is that person meeting the customer. And the customer will frequently say, no, they don't fit. And it's the culture fit. Mm. So if you can do that culture fit question up front, you save yourself a lot of time with you know, the overall hiring mm. process. I think another misconception is it's only tech talent that people are looking for. And we talk to a lot of people and they say, well, you know, security clearances, you only need them if you're tech talent. And that's not true because we need machinists, we need truck drivers, you know, we need truck drivers with the highest level clearance. We need, you know, gardeners to work (laughs) at the White House. There are, it's like a little city and I'm frequently amazed that people think, oh, I need to go get this specific tech talent or tech degree or something to be able to support the mission where, you know, you and I were talking earlier, you have someone who wants to do this work, may not have tech talent, but may have some other kind of applicable skills. And I think it's the biggest question that a candidate, um, a job seeker really needs to ask themselves is, is this the kind of life that I want to have? Do I want the work I do to support an overall mission. And when I talk to people who are in this space, they're like, it's about the mission for me. It's always been about the mission. When I did a panel for the Mid-Atlantic chapter of Women in Cybersecurity, it was really about explaining, you make a decision to put up with the security clearance questions and you make a decision to do this kind of work because this is where you see your career going. And this is, and this is mm-hmm. where you want your life to make a difference. And some people have that question and, and they answer yes. And other people are like, that's not what drives me. And so that's what I think people have the biggest misconception about is this is a real personal mission. It is not something driven by money or position or location. It is really something that is driven by a personal mission. Well, and I was going to ask about that because it seems to me like the the flip side, you, which you, what you mentioned is that your life's going to be under a certain amount of scrutiny, and that's not for everybody either. Right. It's not. And I, when I speak at colleges and they say, you know, that they want to do this, it was like, do you want to do this for the next 30 years? And they're like, well, no, I, I don't know what I want to do for the next 30 years. And I said, well, this is not something you can flip on and flip off. You do have to say... Mm. You know, you can't say I'm going to go be an Intel analyst and then, you know, three years from now I'm going to be a barista. And then maybe five years after that, I want to go back to being an Intel analyst. This is a definite career path. And in my 20 years, I think I've met more than, no more than five to eight people who have said, I'm done. I'm, I'm out of this space. Pretty much everyone else has said, I made this commitment and I'm going to stick with it. All right. Well, interesting insights as always. Kathleen Smith, thanks so much for joining us. I want to tell you about another podcast that I enjoy that brings you smart, engaging, surprising interviews 
that go beyond the usual partisan bludgeoning. The show is called The Gist, and it's the longest-running news and commentary podcast out there. Host Mike Pesca puts forward arguments and asks great questions guided by curiosity and skepticism. He challenges you to think critically. You'll hear things you won't agree with right next to arguments that make you say, you got that right. Plus, he's pretty funny, too. Recent episodes explored the Twitter files, which contained important revelations while at the same time being overhyped. He showed how the Never Kevin Caucus was, yes, nihilistic, but acting in their own rational self-interest. He's interviewed Michael Imperioli and the guy who ran Stakem's Twitter account and Harvey Weinstein's prison consultant. If this sounds interesting to you, then listen to The Gist every evening wherever you get your podcasts. And that's The Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. Be sure to check out this weekend's Research Saturday and my conversation with Andy Patel from With Secure Labs. We're discussing their research that demonstrates how GPT-3 can be misused through malicious and creative prompt engineering. That's Research Saturday. Check it out. The CyberWire podcast is a production of N2K Networks, proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. This episode was produced by Liz Irvin and senior producer Jennifer Iben. Our mixer is Trey Hester, with original music by Elliot Peltzman. The show was written by John Petrick. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here next week. This episode is made possible in part by RSA Conference, where the world talks security. Through global events and year-round content, RSAC connects you to cybersecurity leaders and cutting-edge ideas for a safer, more secure future. Learn more at rsaconference.com slash cyberwire23.